was elected and ran that the bottom 25% of the employees in that county. And so you can see that the bottom, because there was a break at 25%, so I did it that way. Um, the, uh, for the bottom 26% of workers in Rock County make between 12 and a half and $17 an hour. Um, and that's uh, that's based based on those kind of things. The twenty dollars and fourteen cents that I highlighted up there, that's the fifty percent level. So if you make uh, twenty twenty dollars and fourteen cents or less, that's half of the county. And then uh, that thirty nine sixty one, that's where that living wage is. Uh, and that's uh, I think. I think 14% of the county makes a living wage, according to all the, um, the statistics. And, and you know, you can just use those two um, based on one person supporting a whole family. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so here's my new proposal. Uh, I think that I would like to see us develop a guaranteed income pilot program for Gainesville and or Rock County. Uh, it has to be designed carefully to support the goal of bringing the working poor out of poverty. That would, that would be the, the goal. Um, we wouldn't restrict how the money was spent. The payments plus the earned income would provide basic needs. Um, the duration of the pilot program has to be long enough to demonstrate the impact. Uh, a lot of the pilot programs I read about were lasted like six or 12 months. Well, if you know that you're going to get this big infusion of, you know, an extra thousand dollars a month for six months or for a year, you're going to you're going to behave differently. It's, it may not prove what you want it to prove if you know that it's going to go away after a year. Um, and we saw that during the pandemic, with you know, people got subsidies. Mm -hmm. They didn't know when it was going to end, but they knew it was. And sure enough, it did. And um, and we saw the, the um, it, it pulled people out of financial straits for a while, but then when the subsidies ended, they went right back. Uh, childhood poverty was cut in half during the pandemic, um, and it's gone right back up again. So we would, um, I would propose that we partner with community organizations, other churches, and also city and county government. And I'm not suggesting that um, we necessarily that they want to be part of it. As I said before, most of these pilot programs are funded outside of government, and I think we could probably try to do that. We'd have to find some wealthy person who wants to be part of it, but that's what they've done. But the city of Jamesville or Rock County, as long as we work with them, that could ease some of the pressure on them, and they could concentrate on something like um, affordable housing, because we're helping with these other things. So I think it's important to, to include that. So option one would be that going back to the living wage, um, develop a basic income pilot program, not universal, um, but a basic income uh, to randomly, uh, well, in order to bring workers up to living living wages. Whatever they're making now, we would subsidize bringing going from there up to a uh, living wage. Uh, randomly select full-time workers, and it would have to be enough of them to make it. Um, no restrictions still on how money is spent. Again, it has to be a long operation, and we still partner with everybody. Basic income pilot. Probably wouldn't recommend this one just because um, we have to find a whole bunch of workers. They're going to be at all different wages, and then we have to take them one by one and subsidize them the rest of the way up to whatever the living wage is. And that's just going to be kind of a plan here if we don't have to do it that way, but it's an option. The second option is universal income. Again, not basic income, but universal, which means it would be a vertical cross-section of enough people to make it meaningful. So a millionaire could be part of it, and they could get um, whatever, $1,000 a month or whatever. Um, again, no restrictions on how it's spent. The payments have to be high enough, um, long enough duration. Um, for the people in lower incomes, we might need to get waivers because if we're putting them into a, a, an income level that makes them ineligible for government assistance, we don't want that to happen. So we may have to uh, get some, some kind of waivers for that, which uh, apparently is. And again, if you work with the city or with the county, that, that makes that a little bit easier. Um, and then the third option is 
to target recipients. That's a guaranteed income. Again, that's a generic title for it. But we would randomly select enough low level uh, or low income recipients to however many it would be, 1,000 or 2,000 or whatever, and no restrictions. Time of payments to make it count long enough uh, duration to get waivers, partner with them. Um, so the idea being, whatever program, whatever pilot program we put together, then we present our results to whoever, the county or the city or whatever, and say, um, look, this is, if you can scrape up the money to pay people this guaranteed income, um, our results show that it's, it's, it makes things better for the employee, for the employer, and for the community. And some of the, the, the metrics that we would want to collect are, um, we'd have to carefully think about, but a lot of these reports showed things like crime went down. Um, school attendance went up because um, when families have enough money, kids are not under as much pressure, and parents can get their kids to school. Um, mental health in general improved. And these are things that are kind of hard to measure, but we have to figure out the metric that, that would make that worthwhile. That would provide that to the, to the, to the whichever government it is, and then hopefully they take it on. I just have a quick question. Would, in order to qualify for the target recipient, this mm -hmm. guaranteed income pilot program, would low income families, they would be required to keep keep employment. Is there is there a requirement with that? No. Oh, well, I mean, if we can set up a pilot program anyway, we want to. Um, others didn't. Some did, some didn't. Um, but it's not meant to, um, it's not meant to take the place of employment, like earned income. They're not going to get by on just whatever. They're sure, doing. okay. Just, I wanted, I just was curious yeah. about but whether no, it was no. in addition to to, okay, to yes. Yeah, we don't want to disincentivize people from working. Now, what we're, a lot of the objections to these kind of things are, oh, people are just going to spend it on drugs and alcohol, and, and uh, you know, or we're just giving them money, and that's stupid. And it, I can see where you might think, oh my gosh, that's what people are going to get all this extra money, and they're going to spend it on whatever. Um, but the fact is, and again, that's from all these, these pilots, the tests that have come back, People spend most of their extra money on food and on necessities for their home, uh, for their families. Um, kids' clothes so that they can go to school. Some people spend it on education for themselves so they can get a better job. And a um, huge percentage, and I don't remember the numbers off here, I've given you a lot of references if you want to look them up, but um, huge percentages of um, the participants moved into permanent employment, permanent full-time employment. So they didn't have to have two or three part-time jobs anymore. Permanent employment gives them health care uh, or gives them access to, to health care um, and things, things like that. Um, it's just, it's better for everybody. And I'm not, um, I, I found one article that said, oh no, it wasn't, it didn't work in our town. And I, and I thought, well, well, good, I want to see what the counter is to it because I read it. And the things that they talked about was, were, um, well, things like, well, like I just said, except they made it negative. Well, now people don't have to have two jobs. So we're going to have a worker shortage. <laughs> you know, really? We want people to stay in poverty so that we'll have people to work. I, I mean, that just isn't that. I didn't think that was a really good excuse to not do it. Um, but that, so it's a thing, to, though. Yeah. <laughs> it is, but that's not a, a good reason. And uh, and honestly, the reason that I wanted to start and I want to continue to have these kind of conversations with people is the beginning part of my presentation. The logistics about the, the pros and cons of doing this and helping people get out of poverty really shouldn't matter to us. The bottom line is these people are part of God's creation just as much as we are, and they deserve to make a living. They deserve to be alive. And they deserve that their labor provide them a living. And, that, and so everything else is fluff. But it's the fluff that we have to use to convince other people to, to get on board with it. 
But I would hope that, that we, would, we would see that it's just necessary to do. Um, so if you add that guaranteed income to, to the state uh, table in the middle there, that extra $5.70 an hour, now the bottom 26% of employees make between 1831 and 2261 an hour. So you can see how much of a financial uh, relief that would give somebody who works full-time at McDonald's, for instance, or for wherever. Um, you know, the, the people who, who just weren't work in the um, uh, a lot of these people, and I don't, I don't mean to sound horrible, but a lot of these people, um, the entry level positions that they get are, are about all that they can expect to get. But not everybody has the capability to go to college and get a degree and get a job in management. Uh, not everybody wants to. Some people just want to flip burgers for a living, and that should, they should be able to make a living from that if that's what they want. Um, so, that's what that looks like just by adding again. That's assuming $1,000 an hour for uh, a full time. So, next step uh, is I'm going to have to give this talk to, you know, to more and more people. Um, minimum wage issue again, sure. which affects the whole state of Wisconsin and several states have already and municipal municipalities, as you have said before, have increased to at least fifteen dollars an hour. Uh -huh. Do you have any statistical information that would indicate how many people in the state of Wisconsin would be lifted out of poverty if that that single that single wage was listed to fifteen dollars an hour rather than seven twenty five, which it has been for twenty all fifteen years already in the state of Wisconsin with no movement. I don't have that information, but look at that. Now it's people just work at seven twenty five. Hmm? I don't know. I don't know anyone that microphone? works at that rate, so it would be interesting to know that. It would be. Is that still yeah, when know. you're recording? Yeah. Okay. Plus, plus I do know a number of people, when you have the chart up that showed the lowest level, yeah. you know, a CNA what, yeah, what makes 13 12 Sometimes fifteen dollars an hour if they are working for the state for for like the county. Mm -hmm. But if they're working in a nursing home, they might might only be uh, making twelve dollars an hour, caring for an aged person. And what we had this this came up in the, the last time I gave this presentation, and somebody said, "Yeah, but if these nursing homes pay CNAs more money, and they do backbreaking work, I mean, that's Correct. a very physical job." If we pay them more, we'll have to raise our prices. 
A, well, who should, who should suffer? Should it be the CNA? Should it be the, the residents? And B, if you're a big, um, you know, if you're a private place that, and, and it's, it's one nursing home or something like that, you may have a real slim profit margin, and that may be the case. But for the most part, these big um, businesses uh, have shareholders that they have to pay, and they have uh, C-level, you know, CEOs and COOs and all this that they have. Look at Mercy Health System. Okay, that's a nonprofit. The Javon Bay makes a seven-figure salary, and um, they can't Javon pay. Bay? They can't pay CNAs because right. of that. I mean, I, that's just not right. I mean, you can talk about education in general, public yeah. school education, teachers, and people think that we walk around, you know, in rolling the dough, and that there's nothing farther from the truth. We don't work very much out of here. Oh, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. Or we're paid 12 months out of the year. Yeah, right. Okay, you take the nine months and then you spread it over 12 mm -hmm. months. That's what you do. You've got to learn to budget. Huh? You've got to learn to budget. You've got to work for cash in the summer. <laughs> I know a lot of teachers that did. I know. It's all those that things. painted that or yeah. did yard work or whatever. Yeah. You know. It's crazy. Because that 12 months of labor they granted in nine months, too, because they're out working extra. The main thing I love about some kind of income support is that, um, you know, the best things in life might be free, but the things we need to live cost money. That's the way this world is set up. And so it would free people to have more t free time. Mm -hmm. And that is what the Lord, I believe, wanted us to, wants us to do. People could say what they want to about the subsidies that people were getting during the pandemic. My, my daughter was one of them that was getting them. It was such she, a win. She, she was working full time at the end of March. Well, it was about the time that everything shut down. Maybe it was early April of 20. She was laid off. So she had... Um, was able to get you know, unemployment compensation. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't enough to live. Mm -hmm. And she said, there's no way that this is what I want to live off of. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, there was badger care. So she was able to have that for a period of time. But she said, I didn't want that. And she isn't there mm -hmm. and hasn't been there for a couple of years. But during that time period, it was very helpful. And it was helpful for a lot of people that lost income and could not have survived on um, unemployment compensation or some other sort of compensation that was out there. Um, but the very, it's, sad, very sad thing about there is that there was some fraud involved. A lot. Mm -hmm. And a lot. Yeah. And that's what just turns my stomach is, yeah. is those individuals that. The, uh, the payment, payment yeah. protection plan, the PPP. That, that we participated in, um, there was a lot of fraud there too, and I, which I completely don't understand because I happen to know for a fact that they required so much data from us. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> um, that you know, I, I don't know if they didn't use it or, or what. That people were able to get away with. Yeah. with they did from our daughter. She had to provide a lot of information. But she was an example, and we knew a lot of others that, that were in the same kind of boat that she was in. Um, yeah, there was a lot of that, and we, and we heard about that, but I think, I, I want to believe that a vast majority of people were not fraudulent. Right. No, and I think um, a lot of the, uh, fraudulently a lot of the requirement for, for data came from the banks, not from the government, because I, I think the banks were trying to be, as upfront as possible. The government just wanted to 